Hello, and welcome to the ADHD 365 podcast. I'm your host, Susan Booning. This podcast is sponsored by Divergence Magazine, features the writing and art of neurodivergent creators. Published four times a year, Divergence Magazine reflects on the neurodivergent experience in a neurotypical world. ADHD, LD, or ASD in your family? We need your work. And I'm here today with Ari Tuckman. Hi, Ari, and welcome. Thanks. It's great to be here. And we're going to be talking about ADHD and romantic relationships. How does ADHD impact an adult in a romantic relationship? And how does it affect their partner, too? Right. ADHD, obviously, it's an individual condition. You know, one person has ADHD. It affects their some of their brain functioning, affects executive functions, and kind of doing the things that they intend to do in a consistent sort of a way. So because of that effect on that one person who has ADHD, that then plays out on in the relationship, and both people wind up kind of experiencing the symptoms of ADHD. What happens is, you know, in any relationship, relationship. It's all about teamwork. It's all about balancing my needs and your needs. It's all about working together towards generally mutual goals. You know, we can have some separate goals. But when one partner has ADHD and one partner doesn't, it can create something of an imbalance in that, where it's hard for the partner who has ADHD to be consistent and reliable and effective in the ways that they would like to be. But it then also creates a situation where the non-ADHD partner winds up being not the partner they want to be either. Mm -hmm. So they're more angry, they're more controlling, they're more frustrated or disappointed. And it just, you know, like in any relationship, when it gets to that, that point, it's not, it's not a good scene for anybody. Obviously, when ADHD is undiagnosed, don't really know that's the thing that's going on, and therefore it's not being well managed, this impact is much more significant than when you really understand ADHD and both partners work well together on it. Why is it so important to address the relationship impact of ADHD? Because for most of us, our relationships are a big part of our life. And, you know, that could be friendships, family relationships, coworker relationships, but certainly our romantic relationship plays a big part in kind of, you know, the happiness or lack thereof on a day-to-day basis, the sense of meaning in our life. You know, we're social creatures. We're designed to be with others like us. If there's something, anything that impacts that relationship, it's going to be a strain for both partners. And certainly ADHD is one of those things that can impact both partners in the relationship. Let's shift a little bit to how ADHD impacts a couple's sex life. And what the impact of that is on their overall happiness. A couple sex life is pretty important. Um, generally speaking, for most couples, overall relationship satisfaction and sexual satisfaction overlap by about two thirds, meaning mm-hmm. if you're pretty happy in one, you're probably pretty happy in the other. And if you're not so happy in one, you're probably also not so happy in the other. So what it means then is that we really have two points of intervention. You know, if we want to help a couple do better, we can work on their overall relationship. And in the case of a partner or a couple where one partner has ADHD, that might mean things like helping the partner who has ADHD to be a bit more consistent, a bit more follow through, a bit more kind of doing the things that they said that they would do. Mm-hmm. Might also help the non-ADHD partner to be a bit more clear about what they're expecting, maybe pick their battles a little bit more perhaps not personalize those ADHD moments quite as much so the, you know, night doesn't go off the rails when something gets forgotten. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're going to work on the relationship side, but it's also important to work on the sexual side of it that, you know, for a lot of us, that time together, the good feelings that come out of that time, whether it's you know, full on sexual or just kind of shared time together Mm -hmm. helps us, it sort of inoculates us a little bit. It helps us bounce over the bumps in the road that daily life inevitably brings. And Mm -hmm. that reconnecting time is really important for any couple, but especially for a couple who has perhaps some additional challenges, such as what ADHD might bring or whatever else life brings. So, you know, being well connected makes it easier than to respond in a more positive way when the inevitable foibles come up. So like 
partner who has ADHD was supposed to, you know, pick up milk on the way home and then they forgot. Well, if the couple's getting along well, nobody's happy about it, but it's also not the end of the world. Right. But if they're not getting along well, then it feels like the straw that breaks the camel's back. And then their partner probably overreacts to it because, of mm-hmm. course, it's not just about the milk at that point. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like away we go. Nobody's really doing well. So that sexual connection, the good feelings that come from it, requires you to be a good partner outside of bed. Mm-hmm. But to get the best out of your partner outside of bed, I think you also need to be generous and be a good partner in bed as well. You know, like, again, they're very much tied together. What does your research tell us about the happiest couples? I did this survey looking at the sexual satisfaction, relationship satisfaction of couples with one ADHD partner. And I had more than 3,000 people fill it out. So clearly this is a topic of interest. It was really interesting that there was clear, clear, clear differences between the couples who were the happiest and the couples who were the least happy. What I found was that, like, if I was going to boil it down to one line, the couples who were the happiest were good teammates, Mm -hmm. meaning I do my part and you do yours. We Mm -hmm. both invest in the relationship. We do the work when we need to. We're generous when we need to, which could mean sexually, Mm -hmm. including if you're just not so much in the mood, but you know your partner is. What I found was that the couples where... um, who feel that their partner put in the most amount of effort on managing ADHD, regardless of who's the person who has ADHD, my ADHD, Mm -hmm. your ADHD, whatever. Mm -hmm. The couples who felt their partner put in the most amount of effort had sex two thirds more often Mm -hmm. than the folks who felt their partner put in the least amount of effort. So it's like 93 Mm -hmm. to 55 or something. So like Mm -hmm. that is a big difference. Mm -hmm. That is a really big difference. And, you know, we can take the, the obvious surface level of it in that, well, if two people are working on ADHD, then probably ADHD is going to have less of an impact on the couple's life. So, okay, that that's undoubtedly part of this story. But I think the, the more interesting and perhaps a more impactful part of the story is there's a sense of like, we're in this together. I'm working hard, but so are you. Mm-hmm. And when one person works hard, the other person is more likely to also work hard. Now, by contrast, the folks who are the least happy were those who felt that they they put in the most amount of work and their partner put in the least. Mm. And that is a killer because yes. it's not simply the fact that you're not carrying your weight. So therefore the ADHD will be like half as well managed or something, but it's the fact that I'm going to resent the fact that I'm working so hard here and you're not, mm-hmm. that's a killer. Mm-hmm. You know, that's going to suck the wind out of your sex life. And mm-hmm. it's probably going to suck the wind out of your relationship in general. What are the differences in expectations between men and women from their romantic relationships. This was another interesting thing that came out of the survey data. You know, obviously, whenever I looked at ADHD versus non-ADHD, I always looked at gender. Like, you can't just lump everybody in together and just compare ADHD versus not. It was always men with ADHD versus men without, women with ADHD versus women without. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting that what I found, and I... I certainly didn't predict it, but I'm not entirely blown away by it, like, once you know it, that when it's a couple where the woman has ADHD, they tend to do a bit better than when it's a couple where the man has ADHD. And Mm. I think it has to do with the sort of intersection of how ADHD impacts gender roles, and that... Even at this point in history, as much as there is much more equality between the genders than there used to be, Mm -hmm. it's still not 50-50. Like, it just isn't. Mm -hmm. Um, That women still overall, on average, exceptions exist, women still generally tend to be the sort of the caretakers and the coordinators of the relationship and of the family. Mm -hmm. So... When the guy has ADHD and then isn't holding up his end of the bargain in terms of cleaning up the kitchen, picking up the kids, getting the bills out, you know, all that million and one things that have to be done to run a life, the woman tends to pick up the slack. And that's just kind of what happens. But then she gets tired and resentful, Mm -hmm. which is understandable. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, you know, the guy with ADHD is some prince who, you know, doesn't feel that he should have to do it. Like he wants to help out, doesn't like his wife or girlfriend or whatever being angry all the time. 
but you know, that's that ADHD part. It's that it makes it hard to do what you know, as Russell Barkley says, mm -hmm. or I sometimes say it, ADHD is a disorder of actualizing good intentions. Mm -hmm. Yes, honey, I will definitely be there on time to pick up the kids. You know, quick phone call at 4.59. Um, so are you ready to go? Oh, no, I got pulled into a meeting. I can't do it, right? And then, uh, here we go again. Great, I'm the one. And then it com comes to a point where she doesn't even give him the tasks to begin with with and the imbalance just grows and grows as does the resentment and you know that is a tough place then to get out of so obviously when a relationship is at that point like forget about the sex life you know that's unlikely to be a positive experience for them at that point I like what you said there. ADHD is a disorder of actualizing good intentions. Right. That's very good. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, the problem of it is we infer other people's intentions mm -hmm. from their actions. Mm -hmm. I look at what you do and don't do. And from that, I make guesses about what you meant, what your intentions were. And if I get enough data points, I make intentions, I make inferences about your character even. Right. And this is where it's really easy for the non-ADHD partner to start making assumptions like, I think you're just selfish, mm -hmm. you know, or he or she is just selfish. Like they do what they want to do, but they don't do the stuff that I need them to do. Clearly that's going to be a problem in the relationship if you see your partner is just kind of selfish. But it also can come back the other way where I often have couples in my office or individuals who feel the non-ADHD partner begins to sort of doubt their worthiness. Like, mm -hmm. do I deserve better? And, you know, should I ask for this? Or the whole, like, if you loved me more, you would, I don't know, remember to load the dishwasher mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you know, it's not a crazy idea. Like, it makes sense. Like, if I love you, I'm going to be more generous and more reliable and do things for you, even when I don't feel like it. And if I don't do it, maybe it means I'm just kind of done with you, right? Like, it's not its not a crazy idea. Right. Right. But it's not necessarily the the full story of what's going on there. But, you know, then you get sort of like you add the layers on top, as happens in long-term relationships, nothing simple, that, you know, becomes a thing where if the person with ADHD is tired of falling short and tired of being, you know, having their partner angry and feeling like it's never going to be good enough, because even under the best of circumstances, I don't do it the way that you do it. Even what I think is pretty good isn't good enough for you. You know, then they kind of do stop trying. It doesn't mean they stop caring, but they maybe they do kind of stop trying. And then it becomes this kind of awful downward spiral that right. neither person knows how to get themselves out of. And that takes us right to a very important part of this topic, what specific interventions do you recommend for improving romantic relationships? And especially if, depending on if you're already in a downward spiral yeah. all the way to, you know, when, when these problems first start to show up right. in a relationship. You know, the first biggest thing I would say is if there's some ADHD in the mix or mm -hmm. you suspect it, mm -hmm. definitely get that looked at. Mm -hmm. That will be a big, fruitful point of intervention mm -hmm. um, in that, you know, too often I see still at this point in time, like still too often I see folks who come into my office who maybe were diagnosed with ADHD, let's say a few years ago, but are hardly doing much about it. Right. You know, like maybe they take some medication, maybe they got it from their GP, mm -hmm. but it may or may not be effective particularly, or it works during the day at work, but it doesn't work at home at night. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe they don't take it on the weekends and their partner hasn't really read anything about ADHD and they don't really talk about it. So it's like this big thing that's hardly being address. Mm -hmm. So that's my first thing is to really both partners, both partners educate themselves about ADHD. So read up mm -hmm. on it. Um, mm -hmm. Listen to some podcasts like this one or webinars mm -hmm. or go to a conference or go to a local chat meeting. Mm -hmm. Find other people who have ADHD. Talk to them. Find out what they're doing. There's mm -hmm. so much information out there. There's no excuse not to sort of avail yourself of it. There's no need to reinvent the wheel if other smart people came up with it before you. So, mm -hmm. you know, definitely work well together mm -hmm. on, your, on whoever has ADHD. And part of that involves talking about like what are our goals how do we define mm -hmm. success mm -hmm. and you know that's the thing every couple 
needs to wrestle out. So like, here's a dumb example. For me, when the dishwasher is running and there's extra stuff, I like to put the dirty plates on the island in front of the dishwasher because mm -hmm. that's the best place to chuck them into the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. My wife likes to put them in the sink because then you don't see them and they're out of the way. <laughs> now, the problem with that, from my perspective, is you can't wash the pots when there's a bunch of plates in this sink, right. right? So like, and she'll make the other argument that like, yeah, but it looks terrible to have a bunch of dirty dishes on the <laughs> island. So clearly there's no right or wrong yeah. on this. This is just a preference thing. Mm -hmm. But you know, if we're going to have a discussion about how do we define what clean kitchen looks like, you know, we're going to have to wrestle that out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if one of us had ADHD and kept forgetting to do the thing that we agreed to, maybe that's going to be a point of intervention. But sometimes you need to start with, but what are we actually looking to do? Mm -hmm. And the non-ADHD partner needs to speak up and say, these are the things that are most important to me, mm -hmm. but not every single thing can be most important to me. Mm -hmm. What is more important and what is less important? And by the way, that's like all of adulthood and actually childhood's kind of like that too. You know, like we got to make priorities and choices. And that means letting some things go and finding that balance between this is too important, can't let it go versus, mm -hmm. uh, I guess if I got to, I'll let that one go. But then for the partner who has ADHD to really make an effort to step up, to do the things that they said they're going to do, mm -hmm. to not be defensive when they, you know, when it's pointed out, like, hey, you forgot to do that thing. Obviously, it's easier to not be defensive if your partner isn't offensive in how they say it, you know, working well together on it, but to do more than just, you know, one thing. So what I found in the survey was the folks who did more treatments, this will shock nobody, the people who did more treatments got more benefit than the people who did fewer treatments, right. meaning... Like, here's your list of options. First of all, just educating yourself about ADHD. That's a treatment as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. Medication, working with a psychologist or a therapist, mm -hmm. working with a coach, working with an organizer, lifestyle changes, so stuff like sleep, diet, and exercise, which is both an uh, end result of poorly managed ADHD, but also is of good benefit to everybody. You know, we all do better with good sleep, diet, and exercise. You know, the more of these things you did, generally speaking, the better you tended to feel about how you you did in managing ADHD. So, you know, multimodal approach as everybody preaches. So then it would be really important also to find a therapist who understands ADHD and who's trained in ADHD. Are there many therapists who specialize in this or who understand the, really have looked at the impact of ADHD on relationships? Right. So yeah, there, there's the rub. Um, <laughs> you know, if you've got a kid with ADHD, yeah. you're, I don't know. You're probably fairly well covered, you know, like mm -hmm. depending on where you live and all. But but I think it's it's hard to be a child therapist and not know ADHD, you right. know. So for kids, we're, we're pretty good. For single adults, like individual therapy, it used to be terrible. Now mm -hmm. it's only bad. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. progress. Um, yes. In terms of couples therapists who understand ADHD, yeah. now we're really kind of narrowing down. And if we're talking about couples therapists who understand ADHD and also have training in sex therapy, I think it's like me and two other people or something. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's just there it's kind of like anything, you know, that we get these silos. So there's like the silo of people who treat ADHD, meaning mostly individuals, um, if we're talking about adults. Then we have the silo of people who do couples therapy. And then we have the silo of people who do sex therapy. And, you know, it's hard sometimes to find people who bridge some of these silos. So look around, ask around, check the CHAD provider directory. If you have a local chapter nearby, definitely ask the coordinators there because they'll know who's good in town. Do some research and really find out. But sometimes you may have to sort of work with who you got. But this is a place for you to for you and your partner to be your own best advocates mm -hmm. and you know to do the work that you guys need to do to really sort of understand ADHD and work well together. And it also shows why it's really important to educate yourself about those few that are out there and, and read the books and, and yeah. you know, connect, especially to connect with organizations like Chad and, right. and others who are looking at this. And, you know, it's also not to just make this sound even worse, but, you know, it's not simply having, finding a therapist who has the right sort of knowledge base that mm -hmm. you need, but it's also finding one where the chemistry is right in terms of mm -hmm. like your personalities. Do you like their approach? 
approach do you sort of can you work well together and that's not always a given so you know sometimes it may be one of those things that you find a decent couples therapist and then you sort of supplement with some of the stuff that's out there you know through chat and other places on ADHD and relationships and you know there's a small group of us kind of preaching the gospel on ADHD and relationships so there is other good stuff out there and perhaps a little bit of educating the the couple's therapist. Is there anything about this topic that you'd like to tell us that I didn't ask? I think the big thing here is that relationships are important, duh, but But sex is an important part of relationships. You know, you don't have to have a great sex life to have a pretty good relationship. But it really adds something. Like, it adds a zing, a spark to the relationship that I think is really important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the the joke that I have on this is Barry McCarthy is a kind of well-known sex researcher. And according to his research, a good sex life adds about 15 to 20 percent to the happiness of a relationship. So you don't have to have anything of a sex life. But if you don't, you're already starting at like a B or a B minus, you Mm -hmm. know, before day one Mm -hmm. of class, you've already got an 80, you know? So, um, and you know, for some couples, fine, whatever, we don't have to, you know, be competing for valedictorian, but you know, there are some couples where that 15 to 20% will make the difference between passing and failing. Right. And, you know, the process of, keeping a sex life good and satisfying over the years and decades is going to force both you and your partner to really work on being good partners to each other, you know, and standing up for yourself when you need to, but being generous and flexible when that's the better thing to do. You know, I was saying that a good relationship pushes you to become a better person. Mm -hmm. And I totally believe it. It's Mm -hmm. like my big guiding principle, but a great sex life in the long haul also pushes you to to be a better partner. So, you know, it's important. I think we have, we in the field haven't been speaking much about it. Mm -hmm. I think everybody in the community is talking about it at home, but, you know, none of us at the front of the, you know, presenter room are talking about it. So I'd like to, you know, I want to bring up the conversation. I want Mm -hmm. people to talk about it. And sex is often a thing that people don't talk enough about Mm -hmm. in their relationships, but it's important. And, you know, if you can keep a good sex life, that bodes well for all the rest of your relationship. Thank you so much, Ari, for coming in and talking with us about this very important topic today. I'm very, very happy to do this and especially to do it for Chad. Divergence Magazine wants the millions who live with a sense of isolation and shame, never quite fitting the expectations of the world, to understand you are not alone. Perhaps you live your life in the shadow of your diagnosis, struggling with depression, addiction, anxiety, or any of the ancillary issues that stem from being neurodivergent. Divergence Magazine is for you. We hope you hear your story reflected in the fearless words of our authors, recognize the myriad feelings captured by our artists. We hope that as you read and take in these images, you come to accept there is nothing truly wrong with you. We are different, but we are not alone. Thank you for listening to another episode of All Things ADHD. 